everybody doing this morning? As I told the first church this morning, and it's no less true for you, it is very difficult on Sunday mornings for me to contain my enthusiasm. I just keep looking at the clock because I can't wait to get here to be in God's house, but to be with each and every one of you because really only the Lord knows the depth of the love that I have for each and every one of you. So it is good for us to be in God's house this morning to lift His name up on high. And so as we gather this morning, let us lift up the name of the Lord on high.
Friends, as we get ready to begin this sweet hour of worship, let us remind, remind ourselves that it is not truly worship until we lift up our voices to the Lord in praise and song. I invite you to join me as you're able, standing and singing together our opening hymn, page 480, O Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go. Behold, you desire truth 
in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me in a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Apparently, I've always loved to sing because I remember my mama saying, no, don't sing at the table when I was probably about Pearson's age. And as I looked for music for today, I came across a song written in the 1800s by Robert Lowry, which expresses exactly how I feel. He subtitled it Endless Song, and as I sang through it, it struck me that at the end of every verse and chorus, there were hymns that I knew that would fit there. And so I took the liberty of placing small pieces of other hymns throughout his song, and I hope you will be blessed by How Can I Keep From Singing Plus Song.
that in our times of trial that you would lift up every burden that has been placed before you. It's too heavy for us to carry. God, we trust that you can and you will. So every person that has been named here today, both with our lips and with our hearts, we ask that you take care of in a special way. We ask that in times of fear, that you would pour out peace. For broken bodies, that you would touch with a hand of healing and deliverance. Lord, for each and every situation, we know you have a solution, and we leave it in your hands. Be with us and guide us this, this day, and we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his children to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, we have been walking this path towards the cross that we Christians call Lent. And it occurs to me as we have been on this journey of the Lenten season that we have been talking a lot about promises. We've been talking a lot about contracts. We've been talking about covenants. And until this time, if you're like me, you might not have seen a lick of difference between any of the three of them. And in fact, you might have just used the terms interchangeably. But there are deep spiritual differences between these three terms. Now, covenant is not a term that is often used today. Therefore, it's a little ambiguous. It's a little murky. We might not exactly understand the nuances that the Holy Spirit and God Himself attaches to the Word. But today, the prophet Jeremiah is going to paint us a vivid picture to help us grasp the concept of covenant one that I realize now looks a lot like a marriage vow. So let us hear the word of God this morning. <clears throat> Our scripture comes to us from Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31, where we hear these words from the prophet. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. My dear friends, this is the word of God this morning for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Old Jeremiah known in some circles as the weeping prophet. And he is called the weeping prophet because back in the Old Testament days of the prophets, when God wanted to get the attention of his people, he would send a messenger to him, and a good many of the times the message was not, good job, you guys are really nailing this down. No, when God sent a prophet to speak a word, it was because you had messed up and God had a word of rebuke for you. Well, the Israelites this time were no different than earlier prophets. They had been stumbling along in God's promised land, failing to keep the laws and the rules that God had given them, failing to worship God and God alone. They were chasing after foreign gods. They were chasing after idols. And God had finally had enough. 
And he told Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, here's what I'm going to do. I'm sick and tired of these people following false gods. I'm sick and tired of them not doing what I've told them to do. And so, Jeremiah, you're going to go and speak to these people and you're going to tell them that this is it. It's over. We had a good run, but I'm going to allow an enemy from the north to come and to overtake this sweet land that I've given you. They're going to pack you and all your belongings up and they're going to take you off into a foreign land and there you will be separated from me. And so Jeremiah's, the book of Jeremiah is written in this time where the first part of the book is he is telling the, the, the nation of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, what is about to happen. The second part of the book is him addressing the people in exile after the exile has happened. And the particular scripture we hear today is God not speaking a word of rebuke. You see, God has already punished the Israelites. And just like we do with our own kids, we want them to know that a season of punishment will not last forever, but there will be reconciliation and hope after the pain. While you're giving your young and the whooping, you want them to know that you love them and there will be reconciliation. When you put them in that timeout chair, you want them to know that, hey, you have to suffer for what you've done, but I am still deeply in love with you, and I want the best for you. And so Jeremiah is speaking this word of hope, and God wants to communicate to the Israelites, look, I know things are bad. I know you've been over here for all these many years. You've been separated from me, but look, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope for us to reconcile. And we see from today's reading that God wants an entirely different relationship with the Israelites. One that almost looks like a modern day marriage vow. Now the original relationship that God had with the Israelites as he brings them up out of Egypt is one based on laws and rules. It all started at Mount Sinai when when. Moses goes up on top of the mountain. He spends 40 days and 40 nights with God. And in that time, God takes his own finger and inscribes into a stone tablet what I like to call 10 simple rules to live by. And then Moses comes down from the mountain and he presents the people with these 10 simple rules. And God gives Moses another set of rules. They end up being about 603. You know, things like, here's what you should eat and here's what you shouldn't eat. Here's what you do if you've been hanging around with dead people. Here's what you need to do if you've made yourself ceremonious unclean. Here's how I want my traveling tabernacle to be built. Here's how you're supposed to worship me. Here's how you present offerings unto me. So this, this relationship was built on laws and rules, beginning with the Ten, 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 Ten Commandments and everything that followed after that. And you see the common thread through all of this was an expectation on God's part of obedience from his people and an obligation to do things the way God wanted them done. You see, God said, do this, and the people were expected to do this. God says, jump. The people jumping in when they're in the air, they turn around and say, how high? You see, this is how the, the, the relationship was built. But right from the very beginning, even while Moses was on top of the mountain, the first trip up the mountain, people were already starting to fall short. Heck, Moses up there getting the, the tablets with the ten simple rules to live by, and Aaron and everybody's got here fashioning a golden cap, saying, look, this is the God that brought us up out of Egypt. Who's this other God? What has he done for us lately? Who's Moses? We haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. And so on and so forth begins this cycle of God expecting obedience and God's people falling short of delivering obedience. And we finally get to a point where God throws up his hands and says, this is it. We've done it. We've tried it this way. These people can't do it. And it leads to the exile. It leads to God turning these people over to the fruits of their own labor. They end up reaping the evil that they sow. But here's the deal. God was already looking forward. God was looking past the exile. God had always been looking forward to the reconciliation that was going to come 
on the other side. And so God already foresaw a new and a better relationship with his people. Now, if the old relationship was based on laws and on rules, and it was based on obedience and obligation, as we can see from the reading today, this new relationship that God wants with the people is based on mutual admiration and love. I want you to think about this this morning. Why do you come to church here at 1115 every Sunday? I mean, surely many of us have skipped out of church on a Sunday, right? We've laid out from time to time. Did God come with a lightning bolt and strike us dead wherever we were fishing or hunting or whatever we were doing instead of being in church? No. So in the absence of in the absence of a fear of missing church, if we know that God's not going to immediately strike us dead for not coming and doing what we're supposed to do, what brings us here? I like to think it is a feeling of love and admiration on our parts, a desire to be in God's house, to be in His holy presence on this, the holiest of days of the week. So this new relationship that God envisions with His people is based on mutual admiration, mutual love, and think about this law. God says the first law was inscribed on stone. He said, that's not how it's going to be anymore. No longer will my people have to look outside themselves to find out what the relationship should look like. He said, I'm going to take my heart or my law and I'm going to write it on their minds and in their hearts. It's going to be in their inmost beings. Our relationship is going to come from inside, not outside. He, he also said, look, I want this relationship to be one not of fear and of retribution, but I want it to be based on love. I want people to come to me to be my people because they love me. And I want to be their God because I love them. You know, it's almost like God saying, look, we were just friends before, but it's time to change the nature of our relationship. Think about when, when we as humans start thinking about relationships and we meet somebody special and the first thing we do is we get to know a little bit about each other and we go on a few dates and maybe watch a movie have dinner eventually we come to the point they say you know what this is going in a direction that i think we need to change the nature of our relationship a little bit we need to understand that this is a little bit deeper than what it was and so that's all God is telling the Israelites. He said, look, our relationship is getting to the point where we need to, to, to make it even deeper. He says, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want things to change, and I want it to be built on a deep and intimate love. And in fact, if you look at that, it looks a lot like our modern marriage vows. Now, the one thing I want to remind you, the book of Jeremiah does not apply directly to us. So God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah was not God speaking directly to us. He was speaking to the nation of Israel. He wanted a new and a better relationship with the nation of Israel. But I stand before you this morning to tell you that, that we don't just discount what God is saying to the nation of Israel and saying it doesn't have anything for us here this morning because it absolutely does. There's a reason that when you pick up your Bible and you flip to where the New Testament begins and you see that this much of the Bible is Old Testament. This is God's love letter to the nation of Israel. Only this part is directly written to us. But guess what, folks? The story of Israel is our story. Because God is timeless. God, from the very beginning, saw the end. We talked about that not too long ago. Remember, we talked about how God knew that we were going to mess up. God knew we were going to fall short. God knew we were going to turn away from Him time to time. And yet God chose to create us anyway. He chose to have a relationship with us even when we would fall short, even if some of us did turn out utterly depraved and evil. So God's looking ahead, and He's using the nation of Israel as part of His story of redemption, which He ultimately saw we would be a part of. 
And so we are beneficiaries of God's marriage vows with the nation of Israel because God's love to them ultimately transfers to us. You see, God loves each and every one of us here today. And I'm sure somebody out there really needs to hear that because they're sitting there questioning whether God can truly love them. God loves each and every one of us right to the extent that He sent His only Son to come to show us the way to die on our behalf and to be raised from the grave so that sin and death held no power over us any longer. In fact, when you think about death, God has never desired our death. When I think back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 and 2, in the very beginning, death was never a part of God's plan. I can imagine that God's plan was for Adam and Eve to live forever with Him in the garden, have communion with Him. And it was only by human action in Genesis 3 that sin and death was brought into this world. It was never God's desire for us to die. And so what He does is He gives us multiple opportunities to come to life. Yes, we will face a physical death. But eventually, we will be blessed with the eternal life. You see, God wants to be our God, just as He wanted to be Israel's God. God wants us to be His people, just as He wanted the Israelites to be His people. That is a wonderful thought this morning. So although Jeremiah doesn't speak directly to us, God's promise, God's covenant is everlasting. You know what? That original relationship was based on rules and laws. And Lord knows that we couldn't keep laws and rules even if we tried. I've already preached one service this morning and I told that other church, I said, you know what? I can't even keep man's laws. Just in a short six mile drive to that church, I broke the speed limit for no other reason than it was there and I didn't like it. That's just our nature. We have a hard time keeping laws and rules and God knows that. So thank goodness that God makes a new way for us. He gives us the, <coughs> the opportunity. He writes His law on our hearts and on our minds. Not so that we'd be perfect, but that we would know that He is our God. That we would have a moral compass to live our life by. That when we stray off the path, we can get right back on and we don't ever have to look outside ourselves for that covenant relationship. You see, God's covenant of love is for all eternity. It has never stopped. Even when His people were far away from Him, God's love still remained. Yes, they had a time of trial that they had to go through. A little bit of punishment. But God wanted that relationship of love with His people. Now I'm sure you've all heard the good marriage advice that Marriage is about each partner giving 110% to the relationship. Because if you both give 110%, eventually one of the partners is going to come up short one day. They're not going to bring their whole game that day. But the other partner's extra 10% will cover that. Think about the times in our relationship with God where we have brought 110% to the relationship. Those mountaintop moments that we live for but also think about the times in the valley where we have brought far less than 100% to God. But thank God that He always brings 100 plus percent of His covenant love. You know, I heard a story earlier this week about a man in Southern California. He said, in the summertime, I love coming home from work. My family comes out of the house running up to meet me and the kids want to give me a hug and a kiss. And he says, he said, I can always tell when I give my kids a hug and a kiss and I see the sand in their hair and I taste the salt on their cheeks. I can tell that they've been to the beach. Now here's the thing. You don't get that sand in your hair or the salt on your cheek by merely driving by the beach on a hot summer day. You get it by an intimate connection with the beach. You get it by playing in the sand and running in the surf. You know what God wants? What God wants more than all of our hard work, 
all of our disciplined obedience. He wants a change of heart that comes from intimacy, much like a, a marriage vow. And just like that man who could tell his kids had been to the beach by what he saw, what he tasted, what he smelled, when somebody comes close to us as Christians, they should be able to see, smell, taste, and sense that we are one with God and that God's ways are written on our hearts and on our minds, that He is our God and that we are His people. In case there's any confusion, that, my friends, is a covenant. God's covenant of love for us. Praise be to God. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, as people of God who know what we believe and why we believe, would like us to join together this morning in this historic confession of the Christian faith as we profess to what we believe and why. I believe in the God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen. Got a couple of things, a couple of announcements in the life of the church. One, I know it sounds like I'm harping on it a lot, but I just want to make you aware of some vaccination opportunities. If you have not received your vaccine yet, or if you know somebody who's looking for a vaccine, uh, it looks like it's now going to be a weekly occurrence where St. Mark United Methodist Church just up, just up the road. That was there we go. Michael says, this is that one. Every Friday from 8.30 until 4, as supplies last, it's a First come, first serve, no appointment needed. Uh, they are administering the Moderna vaccine. The Regional Medical Center is administering the Pfizer vaccine on Fridays at the, um, at the uh, Orangeburg County uh, Fairgrounds. Uh, both of them are very good vaccines. Uh, you're gonna spend a little bit more time at the fairgrounds because there's more people there, but it's more comfortable because you're in your car. St. Mark will be standing outside until you can get in, but either one of them are good sites. Um, and I just encourage you. Uh, we're looking forward to the day, hopefully uh, soon, within the next couple of months, where everybody's had an opportunity to be vaccinated. We can take these masks off. We can take down the barriers that keep us from being closer together. And we can start worshiping in a manner that resembles something a little bit more normal. To do that, um, we're encouraging as many people as possible to receive that vaccine. Now, if you know somebody that needs a vaccine but can't get there and they need a ride, Give me a call. We will make sure you get a ride. You know, I can call any number of people in the church and give you a ride. I can give you a ride. We will get you there if you need it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Miss Trudy, you've got an announcement this morning? A short outreach meeting at the church today. All right. The outreach committee, short meeting right here up front. Um, you know who you are because I think you were on the text last night. So don't forget that. Any other announcements this morning for the good of the church? Remind the children to come up after church to get their treat. All right, the children can come up front and see Ms. Ellen right after church. She's got a treat for them. Any other announcements? All right, hearing none, I just want to remind you that God's grace and love for us is truly amazing. So as we close out this sweet hour of worship, let us join together and sing our closing hymn found on page 378, Amazing Grace. We'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6.
Him sometimes when we fall short or we turn away. God is right there waiting for us to come back to Him. It is that covenant of blood that is everlasting. That covenant that comes, that promise that, that comes without us even having to do anything but to reach out our hearts and to receive it. Treasure that good news in your heart this morning and share it with everyone you meet. I bid you to go forth in peace. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Hey folks, remember to click the subscribe button below and ring the bell to be notified when we post new content. And as always, if today's video touched you in some way, please hit the thumbs up button and leave us a comment. We love to hear how our content impacts your walk with Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless.